Uh, very nice to be here. So I'm going to talk about mathematics. I mean, we're all going to talk about mathematics and the computer, but I get to go first. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the ways that computers are being used uh, by mathematicians. So obviously they've been used for a very long time. So I'll give a brief overview of the old-fashioned ways uh, that mathematicians have been using computers. And then I'll discuss in detail one of the, one of the several new ways uh, that they're being used. And uh, the other speakers, I guess, will talk about other ways. So other ways are available. Uh, so in fact, computers, rather surprisingly, they've been helping mathematicians uh, and scientists for centuries, which is funny because you kind of think they haven't really existed uh, uh, for centuries. But actually, of course, computers, the word used to, uh, used to computers used to be humans. Uh, in fact, computers were often uh, women uh, because uh, women were cheaper uh, yeah, women, women needed less, uh, less pay. So John Napier in the 1600s, so here's a proof that computers used to be humans. Uh, John Napier suggested he made these tables of uh, logarithms in the 1600s, and when he'd finished, he knew exactly what was needed to make better tables of logarithms. Uh, and he suggested that uh, if, uh, if you were learned and had some pupils and computers, then you could do a better job than he'd done. Then he explained how to do it. Um, and another example of computers from uh, pre, pre the 20th century was the Harvard computers. That was a team of women uh, working with the astronomers at Harvard uh, in the late 1800s. There's a fabulous Wikipedia page about them. Uh, these were people, again, they were women because uh, Harvard realised that they could pay them less than the men. And in fact, some women worked for free uh, because they realised it was sort of a, a route in uh, to research. Some of these people ended up doing research um, with the Harvard astronomers and publishing papers and getting PhDs. Uh, they were sort of employed to do calculations and plot, you know, plot pictures of stars and things like this. Uh, but th they ended up sort of learning astronomy uh, by, by being employed as computers. So there are two computers, Felkel and Vega. Uh, and what they did in the 1700s was they factored uh, every number less than 408,000. That was a sort of a major, a major achievement back in those days. So this is a I, 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 dug up, I dug up their tables. This is halfway through the table. They went up to 408,000. This is 204,000. Uh, so the first thing you need to know about... So this is supposed to be lots of numbers, so it looks a bit weird because it's lots of letters. Uh, but what's actually going on um, is that, firstly, th their tables don't involve any numbers which are multiples of 2, 3, or 5, because if your number was a multiple of 2, 3, or 5, you were expected to spot that yourself and, di and divide by that. Uh, but then beyond that, so the first number is, uh, have I got this, there we go. This first number there, that's 204,001, uh, which is, and it says, it says something like E-N-U. Uh, and, and what does that, I mean, what does that actually mean? What that actually means, 204,001 isn't prime. It's the product of three smaller primes, and each prime is being given a letter, each prime is being given a letter. Uh, and so these are the letters for 751 and 193. And then the next number, 200. Uh, 204,007, because 204,002, 3, 4, 5, and 6, they're multiples of 2, 3, or 5. 204,007 is prime, so he gets given a new letter, which is some kind of curly Y. And then 204,011, that's M times IC, so, which means 31 times 6,500, so on and so on and so on. So this goes all the way up to 408,000. Uh, and one consequence of this is that you can now easily work out how many prime numbers there are, which are less than 408,000. So that was news to Legendre, who was very interested in the general question of how many prime numbers are there. Uh, and so he looked at the tables and sort of graphed how many prime numbers there were less than x, for all x up to 408,000, uh, and came up with a conjecture that the number of primes less than n was something like n divided by something involving logarithms. Uh, C times log n plus d, and he wasn't quite sure what C and n, C and d should be, but eventually he decided that actually probably uh, C was equal to 1, and uh, so he formally conjectured that C was equal to 1, and hence uh, he conjectured that the number of primes less than n was approximately n divided by log n. Uh, and that, that, took 100, that was, turned out to be true, uh, took 100 years to prove. Uh, so that's computers generating data, human computers generating data, and humans looking at the data and then coming up with what turned out to be a profound conjecture that took 100 years to prove. Uh, so next story, 1960s, uh, by this time computers uh, were machines 
Uh, and Birch and Swindon and Dyer had access to the EDSAC 2 computer, which was 6,000 valves. So this is pre-transistor, so a lot of clunking and extremely slow. Uh, but it could do more than one operation at once, which was super exciting. And during the day, it was being used by uh, sort of oceanographers uh, to, to basically discover modern tectonic plate theory. But in the evening, Swindon and Dyer would sneak in with a pile of punch cards and uh, get the operators to uh, let the computer run all night, computing solutions uh, to cubic equations in two variables. So Birch and Swindon and I just generated a lot of data, which would be far, you know, very tedious for humans to do. They generated a whole bunch of data and ended up with a whole bunch of numbers, and then they drew some graphs with these numbers, and after a while they worked out the intelligent graphs to draw, uh, and then they came up, they spotted a pattern, quite a subtle pattern, that would not have been spotted had they not had access to all this data. They spotted a pattern and they made a conjecture, which is called the Birch and Swindon and Dyer conjecture, uh, and it changed mathematics. It sort of gave this profound link uh, between the arithmetic of cubic equations and the analysis of cubic equations, uh, and the conjecture is still open. Uh, so that's machines uh, making data, and then humans looking at the data and uh, trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, so there you go. So computers became machines, and of course, that was just one of the first examples, but the world of mathematics changed forever. Um, and in, in 2013, uh, Tom Hales wrote a survey article with a rather beautiful title, Mathematics in the Age of the Turing Machine. Uh, so you can read it on archive. And uh, this is a quote, I know it's lengthy, but this is a quote from the article that I quite like. Uh, so computers have rapidly become so pervasive in mathematics that future generations may look back to this day as a golden dawn. A comprehensive survey is out of the question. So the, the, the paper is quite long, so you would guess that it was comprehensive, but he's arguing that actually, even by 2013, it was impossible to be comprehensive. It would almost be like asking for a summary of applications of symmetry to mathematics. So symmetry is ubiquitous in mathematics, but now computers are becoming ubiquitous in at least parts of mathematics. Uh, so that was 2013, but actually, a uh, lot's happened since 2013, uh, and really the, the majority of my talk is about one of the things that's happened since then, and uh, the other talks will also talk about other things that have happened since then. So how do mathematicians use computers? Let me just briefly uh, talk about the traditional methods. Mostly we use them in the same way that Bertrand Swinton and Darby are using them. We use them to compute. Uh, we use them to do the work that we don't want to do because it's too tedious. So why do mathematicians want to compute? Uh, they want to compute for lots of reasons. Firstly, they want to model reality. Right? That's a great example. You know, they want to predict fluid flow over an aeroplane wing, or they want to predict the weather. These turn out to be very, very complex problems because of chaos theory. Uh, they want to, they want, they, they're involved in cryptography. They want to like, create codes and crack codes. And sometimes that can involve a lot of computing. Um, uh, an example, I've, you know, I've given you examples already. Sometimes mathematicians want to compute to get inspired. They want to see data, and then they want to look at the data and spot the patterns. Uh, and finally, uh, something I'll say a little bit about, uh, they sometimes want to compute because they want to prove a theorem. Uh, not they're not just experimenting, they actually need to use computers to prove theorems. So these are called computer-assisted proofs. Uh, so I'm not going to say anything about the first two bullet points, but I'll say a little bit about the last two bullet points. So I told you about early examples of doing computing to inspire us. Uh, but this is the L function to modular forms database. This is, a, this is the front page of the elliptic curves section uh, of that database. That's just an example. So Birch and Swindon and Dyer worked with kind of hundreds of cubic equations, but now we have 3.8 million in this, uh, in this database. And that's just one example of one database of, uh, of, uh, of mathematical objects out there. So here's many, many more examples. You know, there's knots and there's graphs and there's finite groups. And there's all sorts of things. There's modular forms, things that I'm a big fan of. Uh, many, many mathematical objects. There's just free online open source uh, tables of these things uh, up, up there on the internet. And uh, historically, as, I, as I've explained already, these tables can be used to inspire humans. Your humans look at them and they spot the patterns and uh, they make some conjectures and they make progress. That's one of the ways that progress can occur. And uh, probably in Alex's talk, uh, we might hear stories about how these tables have now inspired computers as well. Uh, so that's computing to make tables, but what about computing to finish proofs? 
So a computer-assisted proof, uh, this isn't an experiment, this is a rigorous mathematical proof, uh, which might at some point involve a finite calculation which is too difficult to do by hand. Uh, so these used to be rare, but they're getting more and more commonplace now. So the first famous example, an example which somehow caused, this, was a good, this caused a lot of disruption at the time, the four-colour conjecture, as it was called back then, back in 76. So the idea is that you draw a graph that has lots of countries on, and the problem is you have to colour in all the countries with different colours, and no two countries that share a common border uh, are allowed to be the same colour. And so as you can see, you can colour the countries of the Earth with uh, purple, orange, green and blue, and that's only four colours. So this fact that apparently cartographers knew for centuries uh, was that four colours suffice. Uh, this was a, an open problem uh, for, for centuries in mathematics. And uh, in 1976, Apple and Harkin realised uh, that they could reduce the conjecture to a finite calculation. But the finite calculation was very large. Uh, so they had a heuristic argument that indicated that it should be reducible to a, a, the kind of calculation which a machine should be able to do in 1976. I mean, nowadays this calculation can be done extremely quickly. But in 1976, they realised it should be accessible, and they pushed through their programme, and they did it. They did this calculation using an early computer. And, of course, uh, this raised an issue, because this was the first example, historically, of a proof uh, which is not human-readable, right? These people like Legendre and Bertrand Swinton Dyer, they were looking at data and making conjectures, and then humans were proving the conjectures, you know, and giving human-readable proofs. But here, the computer was involved in the proof, uh, and so, in some sense, part of the proof isn't human readable. And at the time, this was sort of, you know, strange news, right? Because you know, this now raises the question about what is a proof uh, and what should a proof be? Should a proof be something that gives you an indication as to what's going on or should it just be something that formally follows from the axioms of mathematics? Because those are two different things now, as of 1976. And, of course, the other question that arises is uh, what if the code's got bugs? Because right? even though people weren't using computers in 1976, people are still very aware you know, <coughs> computer code can be wrong. If the code's got bugs, then the proof is incorrect, but uh, maybe a human will not spot that. Uh, so that was historically the first example. Uh, another example is due to Tom Hales. Uh, this is him piling up uh, tennis balls because he proved this fabulous theorem, Kepler's conjecture. Again, that was open for centuries. Uh, the, the, the question was, how do you best pack cannonballs uh, on a box in a ship? Uh, so it was important, you know, what, what's the best way to put spheres in a box? So green grocers have known the answer. I mean, if I gave you lots and lots of snooker balls and a big box, it wouldn't take you long uh, to come up with the idea. You, like, you, you put them at the bottom in a triangular grid and then you put the next row on the top, uh, you know, filling in the holes. It's not that difficult to guess what the best way is, but actually giving a rigorous mathematical proof was open for centuries. And, what, and again, Hales managed to reduce this infinite problem, because you, know, you can move a sphere around to infinitely many positions. He reduced it to a finite check. But this time, instead of 2,000 things, he had to check 70,000 uh, nonlinear inequalities in regions of three space. And again, of course, he did this finite check in a computer. Uh, and it took about five years for the proof to be published, because the referees somehow, who were mathematicians, couldn't really work out how they could check that the computer hadn't made any mistakes. So the Annals of Mathematics published the proof and claimed that they were 99% certain uh, that it was correct, uh, which annoyed Hales a great deal. But, uh, but that was what happened. So we'll have more about Hales later as well. And so, here's a more, so there you go, 70,000 things. But nowadays, look what's happened. Uh, Harold Health got announced the proof of the weak gold back conjecture, the assertion that every odd number, seven or more, is the sum of three prime numbers. And, the, and the, what the proof looks like is if n is sufficiently large, then general theory can deal with it. And if n is small, if n is, quote, small, by which I mean less than an astronomically huge number, uh, then, you can just, then you can just check on a computer. And using various tricks and techniques, Health got managed to do this. Uh, but but in, co in stark contrast to the Apple and Harkin work, there are people going, oh, well, you know, what if people are now much more used to computers and the idea that sometimes you might have to use a computer to prove things. And there wasn't any sort of fuss about, about this part of the proof at all. It was sort of, you know, there's been some sort of 
shift in the way humans think about computer-assisted proofs. But, but this is some indication that things are really sort of gone completely out of hand. You cannot check 10 to the 30 things by hand. So a summary of this first part, computers have been traditionally used to calculate data, and the data can inspire us, of course, uh, and sometimes the data can even be used to finish the job, to prove a theorem, right? Because that's, that's what mathematicians want to do, they want to prove theorems. And so sometimes uh, computational data can be used to complete a proof, and nowadays there exist computer-assisted proofs which are far too long to be human verified. So that's the end of the first part of my talk. Uh, and now I want to talk about a sort of a completely different way that computers can be used. So um, one thing about all this computer-assisted proof stuff is that there are mathematicians, including sort of serious mathematicians, you know, at the top of the mathematical tree, uh, who don't use computers at all in their work. I mean, many do, but also many don't. Right? And why might you not use a computer as a, as a research mathematician? Sometimes it's because you're studying objects which can't be computed in some sense. You're studying infinite dimensional objects, uh, or you're studying, you're studying some of uncountably many objects, and it's not entirely clear where to start computing them. Or sometimes mathematicians are simply studying objects which are too hard to compute, uh, I guess. Me and other, other, you know, I mean, I've been involved in do, doing calculations with objects which are sufficiently, you can prove that in theory these things are computable, but in practice you can't ever compute any interesting examples uh, because the algorithms we know to compute them simply uh, would run forever. Uh, so, how are we going to get those kind of mathematicians to use computers? Because sort of computers should be there helping mathematicians. Uh, and the idea is, instead of using computers to actually compute data, why don't we get computers to start thinking in some way, or to start helping us to think? So can we use them not just to do computations, but to reason? Right. Right. Instead, instead of working with numbers, instead of working out numbers, uh, can we get them to sort of think about the axioms of mathematics and the rules of mathematics and start putting those together instead? So this is a, you know, an example of a new way of using computers. So why do we want it? So reasoning uh, is the process of you know, trying to prove a theorem. So why, why should we use computers to reason, given that we know they're so good to calculate? So one reason is that mathematics, when you think about it in a formalist way, mathematics is just a game, right? There's, there's a finite list of rules, uh, and you have to abide by the rules, right? If you start not obeying the rules, then you're not doing mathematics by definition. So mathematics is a game like chess, <coughs> this small number of precise rules that you know, humans wrote down about 150 years ago, and uh, you have to play by those rules. And, and board games like chess are now sold. They're solved, right? And there, there are now humans. Uh, that, sorry, there are now computers that can play chess better than any <coughs> human, and uh, there are now computers that can play Go better than any human. And Go is, in some sense, the most complicated, uh, you know, sort of currently played board game because it's played on a gigantic board. You know, you, you have hundreds, you have 361 options for your first move. And so the game tree grows exponentially, extremely quickly. And uh, to get computers to play Go at a superhuman level, uh, by the time, you know, DeepMind had managed to do this, uh, people started saying, well, board games are now solved. So if board games are solved, then what's the next step? And the thing about a board game is that a board game is played on a board, and a board is finite, right? And... Uh, the first thing you learn in mathematics is how to count, right? Even preschool, that's the thing, the thing that you're typically taught is how to count. And the set of counting numbers, one, two, three, four, you know, is the, the most fundamental mathematical object in some sense. The set of counting numbers is infinite. So this is a, one big difference between mathematics and board games, is that mathematics has some sort of infiniteness, infiniteness about it, uh, has an infinite action space. And so, if we're so good at board games, and board games are finite things where you have to play by a list of rules, then mathematics is the, na the next natural target. So can computers become superhuman at mathematics? You know, that's, that's somehow a, a natural next question. Uh, and my personal opinion is that actually we're currently a long way from this. But on the other hand, there's a lot of people thinking very hard about it. So that's one reason you might want to get computers to think, because it would put people like me out of a job, right? Uh, so another, another, another reason is that mathematicians can make mistakes, right? The literature is in some sense full of mistakes. I mean, you know, some important theorems have been, you know, proofs have been discovered to be incorrect later on. 
So mathematicians can make mistakes. Now, of course, if you're paranoid, you could also say, well, computers can make mistakes as well. But my experience on a, at a practical level uh, is that proofs generated by computers or by humans using computer proof assistance, they are also orders of magnitude more likely to be correct uh, than proofs generated by humans. So even though they might not be perfect, uh, they're still, you know, the, the sort of chances of error has sort of gone down uh, by, several, you know, by several factors. So another reason you might want to be interested in getting computers to, uh, to reason uh, is that that process would involve digitizing mathematics in some way, changing mathematics so it becomes something that a computer can understand, right? Changing it from some pictures in a mathematician's mind to so it's a string of zeros and ones uh, that a computer can understand. And the moment you digitize something, you change it, right? You, ch you make it more flexible. Uh, you know, for example, you, you try doing Sudoku in a, you know, and you writing on a biro on a computer, on a, in a newspaper and you make a mistake and you cross it out and it's kind of a mess and uh, you know then you don't know which numbers are right and which are wrong but if you play it on a phone app then you can sort of go back to where you made the error and uh, it's sort of a more satisfying experience. And another example we digitized music and uh, and at the time I was just like why am I supposed to be buying you know CDs are lighter than vinyl that's not really a big deal as far as I'm concerned but the thing that I missed the thing I didn't understand about the CD revolution uh, was that what was actually happening uh, was that we were making music much, much, much easier to store. And uh, so now, nowadays you can, so, you, know, you can store millions of songs in a bank of servers and then serve them out to people like my children who, are, you know, who have the, the world's music uh, in their pocket. Uh, so what's an interactive theorem prover? An interactive theorem prover or a computer proof assistant it turns proving, you know, the game of proving mathematical theorems into a computer game. So it t takes it away from a game that I've been playing for years uh, with pen and paper, and it turns it into a computer game. So it's a computer proof assistant. It's a programming language, and many of you will have seen programming languages in action. So what's the difference between a computer proof assistant and a regular programming language? Here's an example. If you use a programming language like Python, you can just write a program that starts printing out the prime numbers. And it can print out all the prime numbers up to 10 million, you know, very, very quickly. And if you just leave it on, it will just keep printing more and more and more prime numbers. And you can look at the output and say, hmm, looks like this program's never going to stop. Looks like there's infinitely many prime numbers. But of course, you can't leave the program on forever. Uh, and so all you know is that there's lots and lots and lots of prime numbers. But with Lean, say, or other interactive theorem provers, Lean is the interactive theorem prover I use, uh, Lean can actually prove that there's infinitely many primes. You know, you can write a, a finite program which proves that there's infinitely many prime numbers. So that's the kind of difference uh, between a traditional programming language and an ITP programming language. Uh, and as I say, this is, you know, you prove that there's infinitely many primes by solving a level of a computer game. This is just like, I mean, instead of doing maths on paper, you're doing maths in the computer. So, the basic idea is an interactive theorem prover is a computer language which is sufficiently expressive that it can understand the axioms of mathematics. And so question, mathematical questions, like the statement of the Birch and Swinners and Dyer conjecture, the statement of a mathematical conjecture or theorem, uh, making the statement is like designing the level. The statement is like a level in the game, and then, and then solving the level is the same thing as proving the statement. If you write code which solves the level, uh, then that's the same thing. You know, the code corresponds to a mathematical proof of the conjecture. And uh, you, know, any, you can make any conjecture, you know, basic undergraduate mathematical theorems. Uh, you can turn these into levels in this game, and then you can give them to undergraduates and see if the undergraduates can solve them. And this is sort of a new way of teaching mathematics to undergraduates. Uh, so right now, when it comes to the Birch's, Swinners and Dyer conjecture, neither humans nor computers uh, can do it. So the history of interactive theorem provers, uh, historically they were used mostly by computer scientists and they were used mostly to do undergraduate level mathematics. Uh, and of course research level mathematicians aren't, you know, undergraduate level mathematics is the problem in some sense because it's, it's what they have to teach when they'd rather be doing research. So mathematicians would not get inspired by the fact that computers 
could now do what undergraduates could do. I mean, un unsurprisingly. But this century, uh, people have been trying to push them a little further. So uh, Georges Gontier, for example, he took this four-colour theorem. We remember, one of the issues with the four-colour theorem is, what if there's a bug in the code? Uh, so Gontier took the proof and he put it into an interactive theorem prover. So he wrote the same code, but then he proved that the code has got no bugs, because that's the kind of thing that you can do with these systems. So Gontier formally verified uh, the proof of the four-colour theorem using an interactive theorem prover, an ICP. Uh, but this, the four-colour theorem was always regarded as a sort of a weird outlier anyway. Uh, and this, this work didn't capture uh, the hearts of the mathematical community. So I mentioned Tom Hales' story. Hales, Hales was told that his theorem was 99% likely to be true. And the response he did was he assembled a team of 20 mathematicians and they went away and formalised the entire thing. That it's, yeah, again, this is a multi-year project. They formally verified his proof of the Kepler conjecture uh, using two interactive theorem provers uh, for technical reasons. And um, again, the mathematical community was like, oh, that's kind of interesting because they were interested in the theorem. You know, it's a relatively recent theorem. It was 1998. Uh, but, and Hales, you know, Hales won prizes for proving this theorem. But again, mathematicians weren't so interested in the formalization because it was like, you know, they proved the theorem and now they've just, somehow the original proof used a computer and now we've got a new proof that also used a computer. So in some sense, you've gained very little. If you, if you don't really understand what's going on, then you might think that you've gained very little here. Uh, so the next effort to make mathematicians sit up and listen was 2012, where Georges Gontier led a team uh, which formalised uh, a proof of the odd order theorem, a theorem in finite group theory. Every group of odd order is solvable. And uh, so this was not a computer-assisted proof. This was just a very long proof. This was hundreds of pages long. Uh, but again, mathematicians really somehow did not react. Did not react. To so Gontier actually gave a talk about it at Imperial, where I worked, like next door to here. And uh, I showed up. It was organised by computer scientists. I showed up and I was the only mathematician in the room. And I was asked by somebody afterwards, why don't mathematicians care about this stuff? And can't they see that something's coming? <coughs> but we, couldn't, we can't see that something's coming. Uh, we weren't excited uh, by the fact that Gontier had verified a 300-year-old... Sorry, uh, sorry a, 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 it would have been a 40-year-old proof, a 300-page proof. Uh, so, you know, the computer, and the, the one issue is that the computer scientists are going, look, 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 we've checked it, there's no errors, we've proved that this mathematical proof is correct. And the humans are like, well, of course it's correct, because we gave, we awarded Thompson a Fields Medal. You know, we, <laughs> he, he proved it in the 60s, we gave him the highest honour in mathematics, so that the community is saying, this proof is correct, we didn't need to be, it didn't need to be checked. So the issue is that computer scientists, they're doing interesting things. They're proving that the thing works. They're proving the system works. But they're somehow not doing the stuff that will sort of capture the mathematical public's uh, imagination. So what is a modern research mathematician actually looking for? Uh, you know, the, in 2017, the answer is they're not looking at all. They're not remotely interested in the software. So they're not really interested in computer-assisted proofs. Uh, and they don't seem to be interested uh, informalization of uh, important mathematical results that were proved in the 1960s. Uh, so maybe we should get to new, new math. You know, what about modern research mathematics? So the problem is, how do you do modern research mathematics in a computer proof assistant? The problem is you can't, because these computer proof assistants have just got a big pile of random undergraduate level results in them, and uh, and sort of sporadic disjoint projects that might not even compile with each other. Uh, so the thing you need to start to get to new research mathematics, you absolutely need a solid foundation. So in 2017, uh, when I realised that that solid foundation might not be there, you know, I started asking around, you know, where is, where is the computer repository which has an undergraduate mathematics degree in it? And it uh, turns out that nobody was working on that question. You talk to the computer scientists, the computers, I heard computer scientists say, oh, I'm sure we must have all of undergraduate mathematics by now, right? Because, because like, I'm surrounded by people doing undergraduate level mathematics in computer proof assistance. So surely it's there now. But these, are, these people have no idea what's actually in an undergraduate mathematics degree in 2022. 
Uh, so the fact that lots of undergraduate level mathematics is there is not a proof that it's all there yet. And, and it certainly wasn't there. There were whole, there were huge areas. So there was, there was sort of arithmetic and algebra. There was plenty of that. But the sort of the geometry and topology side of things, you know, there was a whole bunch of missing stuff. So sure, surely this is done already. Well, believe it or not, it's not done already. And we can't get to modern research if we haven't got an undergraduate degree. So in 2018, the Imperial gave me funding uh, for 20 undergraduates to work with me over the summer just to basically build the kind of material that we were teaching the undergraduates. You know, I'm teaching it the undergraduates, and then over this summer, the undergraduates started teaching it to the computers. And it wasn't just Imperial undergraduates. There were many other people from all over the world uh, just building a mathematics library uh, for, this, for this interactive theorem through Berlin, unimaginatively called MathLib, for Mathematics Library. Uh, but that's the name we're stuck with. So as I say, it wasn't just Imperial undergraduates, it was people from all over the world. And at the time, the game was to get an undergraduate degree all in the same place, with all the bits correctly interacting with each other, all the, all the things working together. And I would go around and occasionally mention this project to other mathematicians at Imperial, and of course, they were still completely disinterested. So by late 2018, we didn't have an entire undergraduate degree, but we had enough basic sort of algebra and topology and topological algebra uh, that we were ready to kind of make a break for the boundary. So this is what we did. Uh, so we took uh, the work of Fields medalist Peter Schultz. He'd just made this crazy new concept of a perfectoid space. So it's got a zany name. That was definitely part of the story. He's made this new thing with a zany name, a perfectoid space, and it had been used uh, to, prove, to prove some theorems, and we realised that we could probably get there. So me and these two other researchers, Johan Kommel and Patrick Masso, um, we made a bolt for the boundary, so we've got all this undergraduate stuff, and then we just thought, now let's get to, you know, 2018 mathematics. <coughs> so by, by, by 2019, we'd managed to teach Lean what a perfectoid space, we'd managed to formalise the line, let X be a perfectoid space, right? And that was, that was all we did. Okay, Schultz approved all these profound theorems, and we were not ready for these theorems in 2019. All we could say was, let X be a perfectoid space. But this work was completely disjoint to all the other kinds of work that had been happening in the past. And in some sense, it was also completely superficial, because our work was 16,000 lines of code, whereas these other examples I've been talking about were like hundreds of thousands of lines of code, you know, doing, you know, d proving very hard theorems about very simple objects. And what we did was we proved a completely simple theorem about a very, very hard object. So we were going off in a different direction. But really, it was somehow a PR stunt, right? Because what happened was mathematicians were like, whoa, these things can do perfectoid spaces. That was the reaction we got. And all of a sudden, people were interested, despite the fact that we hadn't done anything interesting with perfectoid spaces. We just, we just conned the mathematicians. What, we, what we'd done is we'd shown the mathematicians that this software was ready. And that was, the, that, was the, that was the thing that they'd, they'd never got into their heads before. This software is ready to tackle modern mathematics. So, of course, Schultz was well aware that we'd done nothing, in some sense. All we'd done was 16,000 lines of code. We'd typed in one of his definitions. So the question was, can we prove one of his theorems? So in December 2020, he challenged us to formally verify a technical theorem, which he had proved the year before. Um, so this was a proper challenge, because this is a complicated... What, we, what we'd seen so far in the area was long, long theorems about simple objects. We'd seen very, very simple theorems about very, very complex objects. But he challenged us to prove a complicated theorem about complicated mathematical objects. And furthermore, this was a relatively recent thing. And it wasn't just a relatively recent thing. I mean, he wrote a blog post about it. And called, Liquid Tensor Experiment was the name of the blog post. It was a, a referring to a band called the Liquid Tension Experiment. Uh, so this was the name of the challenge, and uh, Schultz has said in the blog post, this theorem I proved, I think it's my most important theorem to date. Uh, which is sort of an interesting thing for a Fields medalist to say. And uh, so clearly, this was something, you know, you, you could imagine if you work on, if we succeed here, then it's going to make mathematicians notice. Uh, so the perfectoid space um, fiasco, or whatever you want to call it, the, you know, the publicity stunt, uh, drew other mathematicians into the area. So what happened by 2019 was there, there was now a collection of people interested in Peter Schultz's mathematics who were hanging around uh, on the Lean Theorem Prover Zulip chat, and uh, 
when this, when this challenge appeared, they were like, yeah, we can make a go of this. So a team of about 10 of us uh, got to, but, but when we started on Perfectoid Spaces, there weren't even 10 mathematicians using the software. Uh, a team of about 10 of us got together to work on the project, and the, excite, you know, the thing that motivated us to do it was this modern mathematics you know, being formalized in real time. So how do you formalize a piece of modern mathematics? That's an interesting question. What you, first thing you need is a plan, uh, second thing you need is a team, and the third thing you need is lots of hard work. Uh, so there was the plan. We wrote a, we wrote a, a self-contained document uh, that contained, you know, a, a, a self-contained proof. And then we wired it up uh, to a bunch of lean theorems. So e each of these boxes is either a definition or a theorem that we were going to do on the way. And uh, at the beginning, everything was white, and then things would turn blue uh, when we'd formalised the statement, and they would turn green when we'd formalised the proof. And that's what the graph looks like now. Uh, the, in, the, in, the infrastructure there is interact. This is all on the web. If you Google for liquid tensor experiment blueprint, you'll probably find it. You can click on one of these boxes, and uh, the mathematics appears that's behind the box. Uh, the whole thing was, you know, an online. It was, there was a repository, a repository of all the work on GitHub. We would collaborate uh, on the Lean Zulip chat. Uh, so there was a very active uh, condensed mathematics stream uh, where. Uh, where we would just, you know, there was constant, you know, I would go to bed and I would wake up and there was like, you know, more things had happened while I was asleep. So the team formed orga organically. It was everyone who was interested in, uh, in Lean and you know, Peter Schultz's mathematics. And here are some of the people uh, that were involved. And, uh, and the output after, after 18 months uh, was a formally computer verified proof of the following theorem that... Uh, that, you know, some technical theorem about higher extension groups in the category of condensed abelian groups vanishing. Uh, so this, you know, this, was the, this was the goal, a complex theorem about complex mathematical objects. So it took 18 months. Uh, the paper proof was only six pages long. Uh, and we'd formalised all but the last five lines within six months. And then the last five lines uh, were an issue. <laughs> So we'd done everything but the last five lines in six months. And at that point, nature got excited because Schultz got excited because he could see we were going to do it. And then nature got excited. And the last five lines took a year and a month, it turned out. Uh, because they're <laughs> so we finished in July. These, these are, oh, you can't really sit. So the last five lines are just some waffle involving you know, somehow derived functors and co It's an so advanced category theory, basically. Uh, and so the, the problem was, we had, to build, uh, we had to build all of the machinery required uh, to get this last argument, to get this last argument work. So these were examples of some of the things we needed to make. Just so, you know, those five lines, we're going to take five lines in the theorem prover, but only when we'd made all the huge amount of machinery that we needed uh, to, let, to make the computer understand the statement. That was the problem. The computer couldn't understand you know, the objects which were being talked about in those five lines. Uh, and the, for me, the most exciting thing about this is that if you had shown me that thing five years ago and said, can you imagine in five years' time you'll be there, like nobody in the area would have imagined it. So, okay, I'm wrapping up then. Uh, what can we take from this work? I mean, the first thing is that we know the proof of the theorem was correct. So this is, this is a disaster, right? This is exactly how you don't market this work to mathematicians. This is what we learned from history. Telling mathematicians that their work might be wrong, but the computer says it's OK, is, is not an interesting story as far as they're concerned. But actually, even though historically this was, a poor, this was a poor justification for doing this kind of thing, in this particular case, uh, the argument does have some merit. Because the project actually started with an email Schultz had sent to me saying, did you have a study group on this theorem I proved with Dustin? And I said, yes, you know, we, had, we met once a week uh, throughout a ter two terms, uh, me and uh, you know, a group of number theorists at Imperial. We met together and read through, uh, read through the paper. And uh, I told him that. And he said, did you carefully check the proof of theorem 9.4? And we said, no, because theorem 9.4 was a very technical, fiddly thing. And so we got some kind of feeling as to what the statement of the theorem was. And then we got some kind of idea as to what the proof looked like. And then we moved on from there. Because, of course, we're reading the work of a Fields medalist. So we're reading the work of a genius. So we know that this proof is probably going to be OK. 
And his response was, this is exactly the problem. Like, now I'm a fields medalist, people are not reading my work. And I've asked, he didn't just ask me, he asked many people, many universities. You know, did you study my work? Did you read the proof of theorem 9.4? <laughs> and in all cases, the answer was, yes, we studied your work. No, we did not read the details of this proof. So the, the question was, are the referees going to read it? And the answer is probably not. So he was actually, he thought, he thought it was right, but the thing is, he was concerned that nobody had ever checked. So now a computer is checked. So that was, you know, that's one sort of advantage. Uh, but another win was that it was a good public relations exercise because now we're saying, look, these things really are ready, right? And, and of course, you know, you're doing something weird and new with computers, you're doing fashionable mathematics, so more young people get interested in the area. And uh, Lean's Maths Library just grows, right? That's, that's the way this thing works. Lean's Maths Library has to learn more and more stuff uh, to support the kind of mathematics we want to do. So uh, there's some graph of growth in the last five years. We've just hit 100,000 theorems. Uh, and we've also just hit a million lines of code. So too recent, uh, too recent. That, that big kink there, that was COVID, lockdown. Lock we, had, we had a good lockdown because people were stuck, stuck in their rooms. Uh, so, okay, the long-term goal is new ways of getting computers to help humans to do mathematics. That's what we're really interested in. Uh, so that's a common theme in all the talks today. But, um, but you know, going forward, uh, where, where are we going? We've got this big computer brain, what can we do with it? You know, for example, can we use language models uh, to write lean code, which is going to prove theorems? So there, astonishingly, uh, is an example. This is lean code. Uh, so the, 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 the level is this thing here. This is a 1964 International Maths Olympiad question. And you might be able to read that. It says that 7 doesn't divide 2 to the n plus 1 for all integers n. So a relatively straightforward Maths Olympiad problem. But this proof um, was generated by a language model that you know, writes sentences and then guesses which sentence comes next. So it wrote a lot of stuff, and probably most of the things it wrote didn't compile. But the thing is, it can write something. It's not like computers write in news articles and then humans read them. Here, the computer can write what purports to be a mathematical proof, and then the computer can instantly say, no, it doesn't work. Or it can instantly say, yes, actually, this is fine. So this is, this is you know, hard school-level mathematics being done automatically by a computer because it's been digitised, you see. So will AIs be proving the Birch and Swinderton Dyer conjecture or the Riemann hypothesis by the end of the decade? I think absolutely not. I think this is science fiction. But now we can see them solving relatively straightforward Maths Olympiad questions. And so where are we going? Will AI technology start actually helping humans uh, to fill in the details of modern proofs? I think this might be possible. You know, I think that might be one of the places we're going. So, last slide, we're digitising mathematics, uh, digitising things make it more, you know, digitise something, it makes it more flexible. We can start using it in new ways. Uh, and in particular, we could start thinking about things like neural networks or other techniques, maybe techniques we haven't discovered yet. So what can we do with this flexibility? You know, how far will we, you know, these are the big questions, and I don't know the answers to those, right? But I think it's inevitable that computers are going to start to help mathematicians more in this new ways. Will they overtake us? Honestly, nobody knows. Uh, but let's find out. Thank you very much. <laughs>